It seems to me that creativity is at the heart we do in this department, whether we're teaching writing, whether we're teaching literature, whether we're teaching creative writing. So, um, and I think that that heart needs to be honored as much as it can be. And tonight is one of the ways I think we're going to honor that. Um, and I think Carlos is really in charge here in terms of introducing, but I think he's getting people to introduce themselves. So I'm going to pass it over to him. Um, and we okay. begin. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you all for uh, coming. I may have to see my eye doctor tomorrow after, uh, after this. We may all have to. Hopefully, it's going to be down uh, soon. Um, I would like uh, each reader, as they come up, to introduce themselves. Maybe talk about what you teach here at John Cabot. Talk about what you're going to read and tell us uh, a bit about your sort of writing life, if you don't mind, sort of what you're currently working on. I have the order, uh, I'll announce it now, but in case we don't remember, uh, I will uh, be able to remind you. I'm going to read first, just to get out of the way. Um, and then Aiden Fadden will read. And then Allison Grimaldi uh, Donahue will read. Then Elizabeth Gehagen. And this is the order that people let me know they wanted to read. This is completely <laughs> random. Um, Elizabeth Gehagen will read after Allison. Then Tara Keenan will read. Then Gabby Ford will read. Then Andrea Di Robinant will read. Then Connor Dean will read. And then Nefeli uh, uh, Mizuraka will read. Where are you, Nefeli? There you are. Um, and uh, that will be it. I've asked everyone to s try to stay under uh, 10 minutes. And I may be the first person to break uh, that rule. We'll see uh, when I read. Because I didn't time myself when I read this. I don't think it's more than 10 minutes. Let's hope it's not. I'll embarrass myself. So. I feel like uh, when I teach, I often interrupt myself to see if there are any questions. For some reason, I feel like, any questions? Everything's OK. Everything's clear. I'm going to put this one away and adjust this one a bit. Oh, it's broken now. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Sort of. I can see down here. If I look up, it's torture. But. Um, I'm Carlos Dews, for those of you who don't know me, and I know there are some people here who, who don't. I'm the director of the Institute for Creative Writing and Literary Translation here at John Cabot, and also a professor in the English department, and I teach primarily American literature, but occasionally uh, creative writing courses uh, as well. I'm going to be reading something. I'm taking a risk tonight. Uh, this is something that's brand new, fresh out of the printer, something I'm working on, and it's the text of a children's book that I'm writing and that a friend of mine named Dimitris Fusekis, who's an uh, important Greek children's book illustrator, is going to, uh, to illustrate. It doesn't have a title. Any suggestions for titles would be welcome, because I am at a loss for a title uh, for this. What's that? Yes. You know Dimitris. He lives in Idra. Um, there once was a young boy who lived with his mother and father and two sisters on a farm carved out of the middle of a beautiful dark pine forest. He was the youngest child and loved his family very much, especially his grandmother, who lived in a small town nearby. When he wasn't on the farm, he loved to visit his grandmother and help her tend her garden that was filled with flowers, bushes, and trees. His two favorite trees in her garden were the mimosa, that made pink powder puff flowers that smelled better than anything in the world, and the big pear tree that grew in the very center of the garden. He loved to sit under the pear tree in all four seasons. In the winter, it had no leaves, but looked beautiful against the cold blue sky. In the springtime, it was covered with white flowers that fell and blanketed the ground like snow. During the late summer, he sat in the shade of its dark green leaves and ate the sweet fruit it made. And in fall, he watched as its leaves turned bright red and covered the ground around it. He liked to sit under the tree and read books and write stories. On the farm where he lived with his parents and sisters, there were many animals, and he loved them all. There were horses and cows and donkeys and mules, goats and rabbits and cats and dogs. He liked to spend time with all the animals walking in the fields where they grazed. He liked to give them food and water, and he had names for them all. He also liked exploring the pine forest that surrounded the farm. 
The boy was very happy, but very lonely. The nearest farm was far away, and he only saw other children when his family went to town or when he was at school. And he wasn't like the other boys in town. He didn't like what the other boys liked, and they didn't like the things he liked. The other boys liked to play football and baseball, while this young boy liked to walk for hours in the forest, watching birds or listening to the wind in the trees. He liked to read books and paint pictures, while the other boys liked to hunt and fish. Though he tried to make friends with other boys, they just didn't want to do the same things he did. He wanted a boy like him to share the things he liked. He wanted to find a boy to help him and his grandmother in the garden, to walk in the woods with, and to take care of the animals on the farm. He couldn't find a boy like himself, but he knew there must be a boy like him somewhere in the world. He sometimes stood on the bridge over the river that passed through the town where his grandmother lived and wondered where the water went. His grandmother told him that the river went into a lake, then over a dam, then down another river to the Gulf of Mexico, then into the Caribbean Ocean and into the Atlantic Ocean, then to any place in the world the winds and the waves might take it. One late summer day, while he sat under the pear tree in his grandmother's garden, he had an idea. He picked a ripe pear, ate it, carefully removing the seeds, putting them on a piece of paper in the sun to dry. A few days later, he made a small envelope from a piece of paper and put four perfect pear seeds inside it. He then found a dark green bottle under his grandmother's kitchen sink and a cork in the drawer where she kept her knives, spoons, and forks. He put the envelope with the seed, the bottle, and the cork on the table in his grandmother's kitchen. With a sheet of paper and a pen from her desk drawer, he wrote a note. His grandmother asked him what he was doing. He told her, I'm looking for a boy just like me. She kissed him on the top of the head and patted him on the back. You do that, darling. I'm sure you will someday find a boy just like you. He carefully wrote on the paper in front of him, Hello, I'm looking for another boy like me. I like animals, but not to hunt and kill them, to walk in the woods, to read books and write stories, and help my grandmother with her garden. Most of all, I like the pear tree in my grandmother's garden. I'm putting four seeds from the, bottle, from the tree in this bottle. If you're like me, you will plant the seeds and grow a tree just like the one in my grandmother's garden. Until we can meet, you can look at it, and I can look at the one here. If you are like me and like the same things, please write a letter to me. My name and address are below. The boy wrote his name and address at the bottom of the page, carefully folded the note and put it in the bottle. He dropped a small envelope of the seeds into the bottle as well and pushed the cork deep inside its top. He walked to the bridge over the river, stood and watched the water pass under him. He dropped the bottle into the slow moving river. It disappeared, then bobbed to the surface. As he watched the bottle move slowly down the river, the boy said, please find it, please find it, please find him, please find me. The boy waited for a reply from another boy. And on the other side of the world, there once was a boy who lived with his family on a tiny island. He had two sisters and one brother. He was the youngest child. He loved his family, especially his grandfather, who lived on a small farm outside the only town on the island. His grandfather's farm was surrounded by a high stone wall. Most of all, he liked to spend time in his grandfather's garden. In his grandfather's garden were tomatoes, zucchini, eggplants, and lentils. There was a mulberry bush, a carob tree, and special kinds of grapevines and an olive tree that grew close to the ground. The boy especially loved the big fig tree that grew in the center of the garden. The island was very hot during the summer, so the boy loved to sit under its dark, broad leaves and read and draw pictures. On the island, there were cats and dogs and chickens and donkeys and goats and sheep. And on the beaches, there were many seagulls and crabs. When he wasn't helping his grandfather in the garden, the boy liked to walk all over the island. He visited the beaches, picked up the seashells, swam in the clear blue water, and rested in the shade of the small pine trees that, that grew there. But most of all, there were the turtles that would come twice a year to lay their eggs. The boy would stay up late at night on the beach and watch them dig holes in the sand and leave their eggs behind. He would then count the days and return to watch the tiny baby turtles dig out of their sand nests and flap to the water to swim away. The boy loved his family and was very happy, but he was very lonely. 
the other boys on the island like to play soccer and fish and catch birds and tiny traps and hunt rabbits. But the boy liked to walk for hours on the island, swimming in the clear blue water of the beaches. He liked to take bread with him and feed the birds and fish. And he would sometimes row a small boat out into the sea to see the big whales that passed the island each spring. He sat in the boat and looked at the horizon, wondering if there was someone out there like him, since he couldn't find a boy on the island that liked the same things he liked. He had a happy life, but always felt he wanted to share it with someone special. He knew that somewhere there was a boy who liked the same things he liked. The boy on the island would sometimes carry a bag when he walked on the beach and pick up plastic and other things that were left behind by the visitors that washed up on the shore. One day, as he was walking along his favorite beach, he spotted the top of a green bottle sticking out of the sand at the water's edge. He picked it up to put it in his bag when he saw a piece of paper inside it. He pulled out the cork, and with a long stick, he was able to remove the paper and a small envelope that were inside. He spread out the piece of paper on a big rock near the beach. He recognized the words as English, as he'd been studying it in school, but could only understand some of the words he read. Hello, I'm looking for another boy like me. I like animals, but not to hunt and kill them, to walk in the woods, to read books and write stories, and to help my grandmother with her garden. Most of all, I like the pear tree in my grandmother's garden. I'm putting four seeds from the tree in this bottle. If you are like me, you will plant the seeds and grow a tree just like the one in my grandmother's garden. Until we can meet, you can look at it, and I can look at the one here. If you are like me and like the same things, please write a letter to me. My name and address are below. The boy looked for the name and address at the bottom of the page, but all that remained there was a blue and white stain that was the shape of a small cloud. During its journey, a bit of water had somehow entered the bottle and washed away the name and the address of the ascender. He opened the envelope and found the four seeds. When he got back to his grandfather's house, he planted all of them in a large pot just outside the door that led from his grandfather's house into the garden. He checked the seeds every day. Finally, one of the four seeds sprouted. He carefully nurtured it in the pot for the first year, then transplanted it into the ground at the center of the garden next to the fig tree he loved. He cared for it over the years as it grew and shared the very first pair with his grandfather. After dropping the bottle into the river, the boy from the farm had waited for a reply. He waited days and days and weeks and weeks, then years and years. He grew into a young man but never forgot the message in the bottle and the pear seeds. He finished school, then went to university where he studied journalism. He loved traveling and telling people stories. He traveled all over the world writing stories for magazines and newspapers about the people he found there. And he always looked for a young man like him. And he always remembered the bottle with his message and the seeds. The island boy grew into a young man. He went away to university and studied marine biology, but was never happy living in another place. So after his studies, he returned to the island to help with the turtles. Visiting from all over the world, visitors from all over the world arrived on his island, and he always looked to see if any of them might be the other young man he was looking to meet. He did meet other young men from many countries in the world who came to swim and see the whales and to fish and to help with the turtles, but he never found a young man just like him, but he knew he would one day. One spring, the young man from the farm was sent to a small island to write a newspaper story about life there. On the island, after he had talked to sailors and fishermen and people in the shops of the small town there, he decided to take a walk around the island to think about what all the people had told him that day. It was springtime and the day was beautiful and with a cool, with a cool breeze off the sea. He walked along the beach, then decided to walk down one of the roads lined by stone walls that passed into the center of the island. He walked down the road, admiring the stone walls that separated each family's piece of land and kept their animals inside. Sometimes the walls were so high that he couldn't see over them to look at what was inside. He could sometimes hear behind the walls the sounds of sheep bleeding or chickens cackling or smell the sweet smell of, sweet, of spring flowers. As he walked past one tall wall, he caught a glimpse of the top of a tree and its beautiful white spring blossoms. He crossed the road and stood on a big rock to look into the garden. He recognized the tree. It was a pear tree, just like the one in his grandmother's garden. He knocked on the wooden door in the wall. A tiny old man opened it, smiled, and motioned for him to step inside the door. The young man spoke a little of the old man's language and asked him if he could come in to see his garden, especially the pear tree. The old man invited the young man in and offered him a cool drink of water. The garden was beautiful. 
in one section were many vegetables just beginning their spring growth, protected under the shade of green cloth nets. Along one wall grew a row of very short grapevines. Beautiful green caper plants grew in cracks between the stones and cascaded down the garden's walls. But in the center, but in the center of the garden were two large trees. One was a fig tree with wide branches that drooped all the way to the ground. The other tree was the pear that the young man had seen from the outside. It looked just like the pear tree in his grandmother's garden. And as it was spring, it was white with blossoms and the ground beneath it looked as if it were covered in snow. The flowers perfumed the entire garden. The young man complimented the old man on the garden. The old man said all the credit for it must go to his grandson who had always helped him with it. The old man told the young man that his grandson would be home from work soon if the young man wanted to wait to meet him. The old man proudly told him that his grandson had been to university and spoke the young man's language. The young man waited, sitting on a beach under the pear tree, on, on a bench under the pear tree. After an hour, the gate in the wall opened and a young man entered. He was about the same age as the young man from the farm. The young man from the island was surprised to find a stranger in the garden with his grandfather, but was happy when they began to speak. They talked about what they liked to do. They both loved animals, they both loved nature, they both loved plants, and they both loved gardens. They had many things in common. The young man offered, a visitor, offered the visitor a tour of the island on his scooter. They visited all the young man's favorite places, the beaches and groves of short pine trees, the little town with its single busy street, the lighthouse and the cliff sides. And they visited the special beach where the turtles came to lay their, lay their eggs. <clears throat> when they returned home, the young island man offered the other young man a tour of his garden. He explained the story of each plant, whether it was native to the island or had been brought, bought and planted by him or his grandfather. At the end of the tour of the garden, they returned to the beat bench under the pear tree. The young man told his new friend that his grandmother had a pear tree just like the one they sat under back in her garden on the other side of the world. The young man said he wanted to tell the story of his own pear tree and how it came to be in his garden, before he did, he excused himself and went inside the house. When he came back, he carried in his hand a dark green bottle with a cork in the top. In his other hand, he held a piece of paper. He sat next to the other young man, unfolded the piece of paper, and began to read. But the young man from the farm knew what he had written so many years ago. Why didn't you write to me? With tears in his eyes, the young island man passed the piece of paper to the other young man. Look. The young man also began to cry. He saw the water stain where his name, sorry, this is, he saw his, where, he saw the water stain where his name and address should have been. You found me. No, you found me. The young man from the farm took a pen from his bag. He spread the piece of paper across his leg. He wrote his name and address on the stain shaped like a cloud. They knew then that they had finally found one another and that they would always be together. And they were. They would always be together. Thanks. Can I assume that was more than 10 minutes? I think so. Uh, I'm setting a very bad example. Thank you, though. Aiden, you're up. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm, I'm losing my voice a little bit, but uh, I should be okay for 10 minutes. Um, uh, I'm going to read uh, some poetry and some prose. Um, I write under the name of Aidan Conway as a, as a novelist, and Aidan Fadden is a poet, so I have two names. Um, I noticed that I had uh, a poem which is written about a place in Rome. It's inspired by a place in Rome. And in my forthcoming novel, the second novel, there's also a passage which is inspired by the same place. I thought that could be interesting. Uh, very different tone to Carlos's reading. Really. I'll start with the, the poem. It's called uh, In the Municipal Rose Gardens in Rome. Do you know the Municipal Rose Gardens? Up on, by Cerco Massimo? Yeah. Um, facing Cerco Massimo? Yeah. It used to be the Jew Jewish cemetery. Yeah. And it's, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? So this is called In the Municipal Rose Gardens in Rome. It's all go here, all swinging into gear. In these gardens, once the final resting place 
for the Jews of Caput Mundi. Today, slap bang in the centre, but pushed out then, as they were, as they did, beyond the walls to its periphery. They're pruning for its January, and cutting back almost to the quick is the recognised tough love, the accepted husbandry, forgetting them to be their very best again come spring. We too tried trimming his absence the first time, last month, in half a century, at, at the table there would be an empty chair. And yet, in the dooryard, a shrub he planted had sprung a single winter bloom. Now, as a man in Wellington's and outsized coat spreads whatever muck it takes to nourish these dark, shrunken fallows of themselves, the city's chiffon-draped divas in summertime, bereft of their glad rags, their wraparound shades, their pastel lip gloss, their bling. I recall the handmade shirts I'd buy for him, and then his wristwatch, his cufflinks, his ring, the laughter, the half-remembered songs, the suit that in the end he barely filled. This is from uh, the novel, forthcoming novel, which is called A Cold Flame. Show the cover. There you go. I don't have the book. This is the, the previous novel. It's here. So this is, uh, like Carlos, Carlos, it's a work in progress, but it's quite close to completion. <clears throat> and this particular scene, one of the characters, whose name is Francesco, is also at the same location in Rome. And the tone is similar. As Francesco stepped back out, he read Paola's text. Going to see Mom, then on my way home, had a cancellation. We'll ring later. Kiss, kiss, kiss. P. Yet she hadn't run. And now she wasn't answering. He tried again. Nothing. As soon as he had closed the phone, another call came in. Dad, P, said on the ID. On the ID. Weird, he thought. Paola's father never called him but he had the number for emergencies. Yes, said Francesco, ready to rise to the unlikely occasion. Francesco, he said, in a tone he had never heard before. It's Paola. She's not answering her phone. Have you seen the news? She was in Trasteri. Has she called? Francesco, Francesco walked on in a daze. There had followed a to and fro of frantic calls while Paola's father had drawn on all his available contacts to get access to the crime scene. He had been early days, but the evidence was crushing. The formal identification would still have to be made, but it was already there in black and white. Was he going in the right direction? What direction? What was the point? She was dead. There was no doubt. Her date of birth, her height, her hair colour, it was all there in the card she carried. The identity card they all carried, like convicts in their own country. The card that said he was a citizen of the Italian Republic, with its most wonderful constitution, the best in the world, so they said. The card they carried so they could be stopped and checked and identified at any time of the day, to ensure they were not enemies of the same Republic, enemies of the Patria. A card that could be used to trace them to their house, to their staircase, to their apartment, so the knock could come in the middle of the night, so they could always be found. He wandered on up the incline of Viale di Cerco Massimo, past the fruit sellers, past the teenage tourists playing in the middle distance with joyful abandon in the old amphitheatre. They were climbing on each other's backs, playing, playing at being charioteers like Ben Hur, the Jewish prince, who took on the might of the Romans in this very place. Their cries carried to him as they surged across an imaginary finishing line, acknowledging fictional crowds and falling then to the ground and mock the scenes of death and slaughter. Then, like parents giving children piggyback rides, they got up again, a joyous resurrection. He came to the crest of the hill from where he could look down to the Tiber. Behind him and towering above him was the monument, the monument to Mazzini, the father of the Patria. High up in his chair on his plinth, he seemed to be dozing in old age. Venerable, noble, Yet, on top of his verdigree bronze head, the city seagulls perched one after another, as if to take their bearings, 
only then to foul his likeness with impunity. He had not been able to accept it. He was sure first there must have been a mistake. Any number of women could have the same name. It was a common one in Italy, but with the same date of birth, but the details they gave him were final. He and her father had discussed the formal identification briefly, but it was a father's job to identify his own daughter, no matter how close they had been. The police said she had not been caught by the full force of the blast, but that she had been unlucky. Already he was appropriating the lexicon of disaster as his own. From the municipal rose garden, a rich, variegated perfume battled with the acrid summer smog of pollution. Good and evil, past and present, youth and age were tearing each other apart now in his own mind. He wondered why he didn't feel tired. He had instead a feeling of bizarre elation, as though he had been chosen for something, been elected. Something was telling him that life now would be lived on a new level. The old life, like a bridge collapsing into a gorge, was still visible, but gone for good. He moved nearer to the railings and sat down on the narrow wall. An ambulance approached from Viaria Ventino, fleeing then past the Bocca della Verità in the direction of the Tiber. Maybe she was only injured. Maybe this ambulance was for her. Flowers protruded from between the railings above his head, and as a sudden light breeze lifted from over the Palatine Hill, it stirred a shower of petals, and he watched as one by one they fell to the ground before him. Thank you. <laughs> any students here writing poetry? No, any students write poetry? Do you submit to magazines? Well, these are the magazines that I publish poetry in, and uh, some of them. So, just want to mention one of our fellow colleagues, uh, can't be here tonight, Daniel, Daniel Connolly. <clears throat> uh, the only person ever to, put, to, to publish three poems in succession in the uh, magazine Magna, which is a magazine uh, which I've published in also. Uh, so, our English literature department has some claims to fame. Yeah. And these these magazines, by the way, operate in a, in a wholly non-nepotistic way of operation. They have rotating editors, so they don't, you don't get in and then get in because you've been in before. It's quality and, should we say, uh, merit-based. Yeah. Submit some poems. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, thank you. I'm Alison Grimaldi Donahue. Um, yeah, I teach English 110. And next semester, I'm going to be teaching a writing criticism class, media criticism. So that should be fun. Um, I'm not used to using my microphone. So this is an essay that appeared in another small magazine from the UK, Funhouse. It's a wonderful little magazine. Um, and it's part of a series of essays that are auto theory, so they're mixtures of personal essay and critical theory. Um, and so this is a shortened version of one of those. And it's called Incidents in Anger and Silence. It's got a really nice image too that they added on. A few years ago, a piece of late night pizza went from my lips to the walls of my building's elevator. I don't remember what happened exactly. I do know that my partner and I were fighting all the time, that I was an ocean away from my dying mother, that I felt alone and stuck and afraid. This was before I'd started therapy and before I had any idea about the pain loss can actually bring on. You should know pizza is my favorite food, hands down, so throwing it across the hallway, nearly hitting my girlfriend in the ear with it meant something. It meant I was angry. And that was my principal emotion for a few years at least. It would come and go, I wasn't a rage-fueled monster all the time, but it was all I had. It was the only way I knew how to cope. The pizza stain, a clump of red sauce crusted onto the elevator wall, didn't fade for months. No one washed it off, and every time I'd step into the elevator, I'd look at it and remind myself of this other person I was capable of becoming, this other person I couldn't stand. The day after the pizza incident, my girlfriend told me to go to, go to therapy or it was over. Anger is a useful and necessary emotion but also one that tends to eat up all the other calmer, more rational pieces of me. 
The pizza incident is rage. It is an inability to communicate what I'm actually feeling. It is a buildup of what I'm afraid to express or unable to express. It is the buildup of pregnant silences that fail to emerge as language. In the medieval romance, Le Roman de Silence, a baby girl is born to a knight and his chosen bride, but they're disappointed because they need a male heir. So they tell everyone, including the child, that she's a boy. They name her Silentius, which they figure can be easily changed to Silentia if need be, and let her grow. After a few years, some troubadours come around and Silentius is intrigued and decides to learn their trade. She ends up being the most talented among them and in turn, they come to envy her. Those other poets plot to kill her. When Silentius finally returns to fight in a local battle, her aunt attempts seduction. And when she is rejected, she sets Silentius the impossible task of catching Merlin. Merlin can only be captured by a woman. And when Merlin appears, Silentius becomes Silentia instantly and thus the new queen. As queen, Silentia can no longer live in hiding, but the free, strong poet Silentius dies, and Silentia, who will live up to more, much more to her name, is born. Only by remaining silent about her gender was Silentia able to have a voice. The hiding she was living in is mu was much more liberating than her new life as a woman. The voice she once possessed and controlled vanishes in relation to her new body and her new self. Language and poetry have always been tied to creation. When language is accessible to us and the language we speak is taken as valid, we're able to create and represent ourselves. When this doesn't happen, when we are silenced, or when our language is not understood, misunderstood, misinterpreted, miscoded, we are not fully present to the world. Our bodies then speak for us, be for us, often betraying us and leaving us at the mercy of the other's interpretations. Judith Butler in a seminar presented at the European Graduate School states, my autonomy is an announcement in relation. I am already bound up with others. Who Silentius and Silentia are or is can be many things, but that's never alone. This ability to speak for ourselves and gain self-directed representation would seem obvious, but it's not. Politicians and police show us daily that we are not in control of these bodies we inhabit. They do not give us a chance to speak or be heard in relation to institutions, the media, all kinds of powers. As I've grown older, I've become more openly queer. That is, you see me on the street and I'm not always very gender conforming. When I'm not recognized, I feel uncomfortable. When I'm mistaken for something else, but what is that something else? Neither both, nor, or and, the eyes set on me and I tremble. Of course, when a body is different or new, uncategorizable to us, even when it does speak to us, we are bound to misinterpret its language. In some cases, cases we see daily in the news under the Trump administration, even when something is being said by any group of others, it can be heard in a completely and utterly different way, taken for its own purposes and out of context. In his book, Between Dog and Wolf, David Levi Strauss writes, Columbus saw the Indians not only as unlettered, but also without the power of meaningful speech. He promised the king and queen to bring six of the Indians back to Spain, that they may learn to speak. The, admirable had the, the admiral had the curious habit of listening to the Indians speak to him in their own languages and believing that he understood them as if they were trying to speak Spanish, but doing it badly. This allowed him to hear what he wanted to hear. This story not only attests further to Christopher Columbus's psychosis, acting in a way that wouldn't seem surprising from the current US president, but it should also remind us all that we are often not speaking the same la language even if we think we are. Even if national cries were to be heeded in the United States and English were to become the official language, division and confusion would still wield their power. In Monolingualism of the Other, Jacques Derrida writes on the elusive nature of monolingualism and what monolis monolistic culture present. In what language does one write memoirs when there has been no authorized mother tongue? How does one utter a worthwhile I recall when it is necessary to invent both one's language and one's I? Generations of people have never had an eye, and it is not something that will happen overnight. Finding a way for queer people, immigrants, people of color to find a way into the dominant language, despite the violence dominant language has inflicted and taken hold of within that language in full possession would be a revolution. If this eye and the language that is needed, as Derrida suggests, is to be invented all at once, how can the subject dare to want and dare to desire anything? Subjectivity and language are necessary to express desires and to make speech and writing accessible. We talk to one another if we're given the chance, but something blocks the communication, hatred, prejudice, perhaps most often ignorance, if subjecthood, if the I is so gravely misunderstood. 
Without a firm grasp of this eye, we remain silent. Language remains distant and in someone else's hands. I first understood my female, my queer anger in high school. I went to a Catholic all-girls school where I never felt uncomfortable speaking up in class. But then I went to a weekly citywide humanities program at a local university. I'd show up for each session full of ideas, only to find I hadn't the courage to share them. I once tried to argue with a boy from some other school about a human rights issue, but I couldn't physically get the words out. I was angry, I was passionate, and I ended up crying to myself in the bathroom. And when I'm angry, my voice still trembles like it did in high school. My body ignores the head and only feels the heart racing, the sweat accumulating. And if I get angry in my second language, it's even worse. The words don't come at all. I stand there silent and defenseless. In Laugh of the Medusa, Elaine Sisu writes, listen to a woman speak at a public gathering if she hasn't painfully lost her wind. She doesn't speak. She throws herself trembling body forward. She lets go of herself. She flies. All of her passes into her voice and it's with her body that she vitally supports the logic of her speech. Her flesh speaks true. She lays herself bare. In fact, she physically materializes what she's thinking. She signifies it with her body. In a certain way, she inscribes what she's saying because she doesn't deny her drives the intractable and impassioned part they have in speaking. Her speech, even when theoretical or political, is never simple or linear or objectified or generalized. She draws herself into history. In a shift of, in a shift of perspective, we could all be happy that this is the way women's speech is seen. But there are so many instances when I'd rather seem simple and linear. I'd like to have an objective point of view with the knowledge of the impossibility of that happening. But that would also be a lie. In fact, all bodies speak, but it is the different bodies that yell. The white, cis, able-bodied, hetero body is the only one granted neutrality. And I love that my body can speak. If only in the eyes of ears of others, it didn't take away, but rather added to what I was saying. Because language moves us in our whole bodies. Our brains, they're in our bodies. Language can move us like music. It can send vibrations. It can teach us something, not only with the head, but with the rest of us too, if we allow it. Living on the outside of the norms in any way, when the words do not come together with the identity, robs us both of subjecthood and language. Again, Derrida, I wonder if one can love, enjoy oneself, pray, die from pain, or just die plain and simple in another language, or without telling anyone about it, without even speaking at all. Even as we speak a dominant language, it is not fully ours. Bodies like mine didn't make this language, and the process to make it my own needs so much courage and patience. Physicist Karen Barada said, not even nothing can be free of ghosts. My silence, our silence, it is always and forever so full. I think of that night throwing the pizza, the action out of anger, it was also all the language my body and my tongue could muster. All of my motives for rage were happening in another language. People around me could only hear the difference. They failed to hear the similarities. Each day we attempt to speak, but our bodies precede us and snatch up our words. We are unable to hear and be heard through all this silence. Thank you. So excited to read in my sunglasses, but now I don't really think I have the excuse. So, although it's still a little glary, it was very intimidating to follow Allison. Um, I'm Elizabeth Gehagen. I teach creative nonfiction and travel writing, and writing like writing the Eternal City, and how to read like a writer, and sometimes Hemingway. <laughs> and um, I'm a fiction writer by trade, but People sort of like my nonfiction better, it seems like. Nonetheless, I'm reading fiction tonight. And I'm very happy to announce that this story is from a forthcoming collection that will be out next year. I just sold my first oh. collection of short stories. Oh. In a very small press. Okay. So um, Stephanie said I should read something funny. So I was going to read something depressing. But it's kind of good she picked funny, because that means for the first time maybe ever on this terrace, I'm going to read something that doesn't have sex, drugs, or swear words in it that I'm, sh that I'm aware of, at least in the first four or five pages. It's called Pura Goaloa, which means Holy Bat Cave Temple. But that's about 20 pages in, so you guys won't hear about it anyway. 
It was on the road to Denpasar to renew her visa when she landed upon it. The driver, Putu, had just swerved around a scooter, three kids perched upon it and leaning, then veered toward the shoulder where a woman with bare feet and a hiked up sarong crouched, crouched, jabbing a stick at a burning plastic bag, smoke snaking through the open windows of the vehicle, her morning dose of jamu sloshing in her stomach, telltale wave of the motion sickness that always plagued her. Stare straight, she reminded herself, eyes on the horizon. But there was no horizon, only a knot of traffic as they slowed to a crawl for the tail end of a passing procession, making its way into a walled temple, its guardian statues resembling fierce cartoons, gamelan, gamelan music jangling her already jangled nerves. Focus, find your drishti. That's right, she thought. Drishti. It was so perfect, really. She clutched her newly returned passport ever tighter for fear of it flapping open to reveal her true name. Over the years, she had made varied attempts at inhabiting other monikers. None had lasted. None had ever been capable of erasing the name her father had seen fit to dog her with. But now, as if the new moon were delivering her from it, she rechristened herself Drishti. Right there in the minivan, silently repeating it over and over, even though she wanted to shout it out. With a calm befitting her new identity, she vowed to embody concentration, refocusing her gaze over Putu's dashboard idols and out to the road. Drishti sat sandwiched between two others in the row just behind the driver. On her left was a woman with overprocessed yellow wisps, artfully swept up in a plastic clip in hopes of disguising the bald patches peeping between strands. She had already noted the woman's chipped pink polish, the freckled sag of her cleavage, and her sequined flip-flops that that morning in the, the, Bintang, the Bintang parking lot, where a loose constellation of tourists, expats, and overstays stood waiting for the driver. In one fashion or another, each had found the same woman, also named Putu, who facilitated tourist visas from the stoop of a small shop off Jalan Hanuman. Ten days earlier, Drishti had forked over 700 rupiah in her American passport with some trepidation to the stranger who demonstrated no official documentation and offered no guarantee, instructing her to wait for a text message. The passenger beside her, it was now clear she was an Australian, spoke over her to the lanky man on Drishti's right. The man's jaw hosted the shadow of a reddish beard, his large hands cupping the worn knees of what her father would have called dungarees in a shade of demon that screamed 70s, not in a hipster sort of way, but in a plucked from a pile of donated clothing at the Salvation Army sort of way. The man had been quiet at first, but after the Aussie embraced the role of inter interlocutor, he began to grow more, more animated, commandeering the conversation. Once upon a time, he'd been a UPS delivery man, but a busted knee and an expired insurance plan had put him out of the business. He'd lost everything, or whatever there was for losing, he said, which included a tract house and a subdivision outside of Salt Lake and a beloved fat boy, neither of which he'd come close to paying off. He introduced himself, not to Drishti, but he wasn't exactly ignoring her either. His name was Kenneth Love Billings. He said God had brought him to Bali, and he announced that he was a spiritual advisor. He assured whoever was listening, and now everybody else in the van, even those in the way back, had an ear cocked his way, that he administered consultations on Monday nights at the back table of a Penistanan cafe on a first-come, first-served basis. He did not charge, he told them, but he felt it only right to accept donations, the suggested amount being 50 US dollars. He added that he had no phone. Email the Aussie probed, in response, Kenneth Love Billings hurled his long frame forward with a jerk and extracted a small stack of cards from his pocket, dispensing them all around. Hands reached up from behind her to take them, not wanting to seem, seem impolite. Drishti accepted one too, tucking it into her passport as if it were a bookmark. If she'd ever envisaged, envisaged, envisaged a spiritual advisor, and she had, her passport, uh, sorry, if she'd ever envisaged a spiritual advisor, and she had, the ones she'd imagined looked nothing like Kenneth Love Billings. Yet not having conjured this likeness did not diminish the fact that she yearned for something. Call it a guru, maybe just a teacher, anyone who could help her navigate her way back out of the many forked paths of the rice paddies and into the beyond. Since her arrival, she'd faithfully attended yoga nidra classes at sundown, though she usually fell asleep. 
what with the delicious weight of Kintamani black sand inside the hand-stitched eye pillows and the instructor's silky voice guiding her through the meditation. She had also tested out healing massages, vitamin B12 shots, and sacred colonics. She'd even submitted, submitted to rectal ozone injections, allowing the practitioner to see what only her ex-husband had ever viewed up close. And now she was waitlisted for a session with a life coach who would administer beta release therapy to align the left and right sides of her brain, assuming she would get the visa, new, re, visa renewal approved, that is. But a life coach wasn't necessarily spiritual, she thought. Years ago, that word might have made her shudder. No more. Like everyone else on the island, she had read the book and watched the movie, but would never admit to wanting to emulate it. Visiting a shaman had become passé, and everybody knew the shaman had long, long since lost his powers when he sold himself out to publish a coffee table book. Or so she'd been told, quickly omitting that stop from her itinerary, not entirely without regret. She liked to think of herself as a traveler, not a tourist, and she found it bothersome that she was not alone in this. Aside from the mother-daughter foodie duo she'd met in Semignac and the brunette from the Bay Area who gloated about hooking up with a Kuda cowboy, every person Drishti encountered felt the same way. Nobody could admit a dependence on TripAdvisor or the fact that they'd never actually eaten in a traditional warung. Nobody ever mentioned that their contact with the locals was limited to ordering overpriced raw food or making arrangements for spa days. Disembodied vo voices, goddess girl, the pregnant Swede, the reflexologist with the shaved head, or maybe even the standoffish writer chimed in from the back of the van, all with questions for Kenneth Love Billings. Drishti's motion sickness kept her from observing him more closely, something she very much wanted to do. She reminded herself to keep looking forward. Riding shotgun was a 20-something with a man bun, batik tank, flowy white trousers, when he leaned over to pluck his iPhone, the ringtone played Krishna Das, Krishna Das from the expedition grade day pack beside his, beside his tanned feet. She glimpsed the edge of a massive tattoo arcing up over his sculpted shoulders, angel wings. She'd missed that detail when they chatted back at Bintang. He had referred to himself as a digital nomad, a label she was unfamiliar with. But like so many of the other Westerners in town, he'd mentioned completing his 500-hour yoga teacher training, although he was currently consulting for Snapchat. For the next few minutes, Man Bun's phone conversation squelched the clamor for spiritual advice inside the van. Piecing together one-sided conversations was something of a specialty for Drishti. The last year of her marriage spent straining to eavesdrop on Stewart's calls had polished her ability to fill in blanks. From what she could glean, Manbun had leased a house with a pool on the cheap from a Balinese family and was now advertising it on Airbnb for quadruple the price. The proceeds all neatly wired into his PayPal account while he couch surfed elsewhere. As soon as he hung up, the phone rang again, Om Naya Shibaya, and he made arrangements to surf Uluwatu the next day. YOLO, he said, tilting his body out of the window, not unlike a Labrador loving the breeze. Although Putu the visa go-between had tr entrusted their fates to Putu the driver, whatever bureaucratic magic she had managed resulted in the group of them skipping the haphazard line spilling onto the steps at immigration. They were invited to sit in a crowded room with a sticky floor and little air. A crying baby and the occasion occasional garble announcement, or garbled announcement over the loudspeaker created a din. Every so often a number would flash on the screen over the filthy... Sorry, almost done. the filthy window where nobody sat at the counter. The door beside it would open a crack to reveal an officer who'd beckon the next person into the office for fingerprinting. The process was brief and painless. Or maybe it actually took a long time. Had she simply tuned out? Even with her newfound focus, just she wasn't sure. She felt an extraordinary calm. Could it be the presence of Kenneth Love Billings on the folding chair beside her? Thank you. Hi, my name's Tara Keenan, and um, I, I normally don't write, uh, I do creative writing. Um, I once was a creative writer as a kid, and um, the PhD kind of beat it out of me. <laughs> um, and so I'm just trying to get back to that. And um, so this is um, a story about people 
who um, are trapped in in the time period where the where they are, and um, I'm reading it. I guess uh, some of you have already heard it. Uh, I read it at Garbo, and um, four years ago this weekend, I was with Jahan, and my mother died um, very suddenly, and um, so this is part of her story. I always cry. I always say I don't. Mind. Okay, so. Pushing through the crowd toward the bar, he opened his arms to pull her toward the stool and patted it with his other hand. Manhattan, Rob Roy, perfect, she said, placing her clutch on the soft wood and turn, turning to face him. She scanned over his shoulder. The crowd seemed a bit bohemian, but it was a good place as any to get in from the damp wind. Plus, where else would she ever find herself among Negroes, flower children, and even a handful of <coughs> bachelors? Voices from around the room softly echoed McCartney as he sang. The day had been surprisingly cliché. They had walked every inch of the Castro, then over the hill to the Haight for dinner, and now back for a drink before turning in. You gotta be kidding me. No, I'm not asking for you to make it without making any mistakes. Mora, he snapped his head toward her, his gaze finally catching up. You believe this, kid? The bartender looked all of 22. He wore his grin like a wire hanger, holding up a down coat. Looking back at the bartender, Jerry flashed a lazy smile back. In fact, all I see here is Meisterbrow. Where's the Guinness anyways? You call yourself an Irish place. I don't call it anything, the bartender said, straightening up a napkin caddy. If you want Guinness, we do have it. Do you want a pint? He threw down a coaster in front of Jerry. Jerry's eyes seemed to hang on every detail, everyone, a bit too long. He looked down at the coaster, then slowly pulled his eyes back up. Nah, I don't want any. Not a beer man. He flicked his nails across the bar like the suggestion was an insect. And searching the bartender's eyes, he added, Give me a dram buoy. Nah, too sweet. What the hell, a rusty now? His gaze locked, the bar locked on the bartender, daring him not to know how to make it. The bartender wordlessly turned and in one motion picked up a short glass and tossed it in the air as he plunged the scoop into the ice. Mara thought back to dinner as she drew in a shallow sip. She weighed the wisdom of mentioning that maybe this one would be a boy. It might soften him, but it could also give him false hope. She already knew with her luck it'd be another girl. Plus, he was beyond rational discussion at this point. Why did she never remember the rules she set for herself so many years ago after Coney Island? The bartender carefully placed the drink on the coaster. Jerry picked it up and looked for an audience at the bottom. He pulled out the lemon peel and uncoiled it, sliding his fat finger along the rind, and then he bit the zest from under his stubby nail. A long gulp. Say, is that a fishtail and anchor on your arm? Did it hurt? Let me see, he said to the bartender. And then, Mora, get a load of this. She glanced down. A mermaid. From where I'm standing at, ain't no mermaid. He whooped and slapped the bar. The bartender whipped his arm off the table and turned down his rolled up sleeve moving farther down the bar. This conversation was not over. Jerry, why do you have to equate each baby with financial ruin? We're doing fine. My paychecks from the hospital float in the drawer for weeks. He gently snorted, casting his eyes down, deep. The short glass, six inches under his folded chin, seemed to be a door to another reality. He steadied himself, grabbing the bar. The ice cubes not yet melted clinked louder now that the top was no longer suspended in amber liquid. He pulled his gaze up, his green eyes icier, and looked her square in the eye, straining to focus. He blinked three times, slowly. Don't bullshit a bullshitter, Mora. I know those women's livers are putting on a convincing show, but Mora, Contrary to what that free Dan says, you can't have it all. And if you want it all, something's going to have to give. He exhaled a long stream of smoke in her direction, 
and stubbed out his new port in the glass ashtray. We're on to women's lib now. She bit her lower lip and curled the top one. She had to turn this up a notch to get him to back down. Jerry, what do you want me to do about this baby? What am I supposed to infer from this sudden interest in women's lib? She couldn't even name what he might be suggesting. In her head, it was so unthinkable. Her head throbbed. His eyes cleared for a second as he blinked. Faster now. Nothing. No, nothing. He drained his glass and decisively tapped the bar with both hands. I'm going for a smoke. With newfound confidence and clarity, he turned for the door. Typical. She circled the glass with her finger. The jukebox seemed to laugh at her as, as the record dropped. Only the lonely. She leaned into the bar a bit more to cover more of her legs, but her knees could go no far further. Where was the bartender? Her eyes moved from glass to glass and very few were full. A boy that couldn't have been more than 15 had taken over and was making his way down the bar in order to ask customers to point to the bottles they wanted. And she was at the end. She pulled the last slip, sip through her back teeth as she looked out on t into the window. Car after car rolled down the hill, past the bar, in time with the slow rhythm of the music. Thoughts skipped from the birthday party she had two days to prepare for when she got back to work and the nurse she caught rummaging through the restricted cabinet last week. She was going to have to invite his family to the party, which meant so much more than just a quick one-hour party, and that new nurse was going to get her license revoked, which would ruin her life, both certainties. Her fingers circled the rim of the glass. An hour had passed. Still no Jerry. There was no way she was going to get up and try to find him after the path he decided to take in this conversation. No way in hell. No doubt he was holding court, talking about Nixon, his favorite nemesis. Let me tell you about St. Dicky. Her face was still boiling. And the skin on her arms was beginning to prickle as she stared at the clock. Then there he was, carefully threading himself through the crowd, hand moving from shoulder to shoulder to navigate. Hey, Toots, what you been up to? He started. What do you think? Waiting. She stubbed her out her cigarette hard. She could no longer contain her fury behind her pitch-perfect makeup and hair like she had been doing all night. Waiting, he parroted to himself. Yes, Jerry, waiting. You were gone one hour and 18 minutes. Her tone seemed to roll right off of him. <laughs> he looked up again at the bartender who had suddenly reappeared behind the bar, who was lingering. This is my wife. He attempted to cup her cheeks in his hands, but as he did so, he began to totter. I got it, I got it, Jerry said as his hand slipped off her face, and she caught an elbow and pushed him onto the stool. As Mora's eyes traveled to the floor, so she could try and compose herself. She noticed how disheveled Jerry now looked. The shirt tail, the hair. Jerry, where's your jacket? His eyes cleared for an instant. No response. Jerry, I said, where's your jacket? Jerry watched the scene blankly as he sat slumped on a stool. Then he looked back up at the bartender. He held out his, his hand, palm up, towards Mora. This is my wife, told ya. He laughed weakly. Mora's teeth began to sweat as her ears started piercing themselves from the inside. She felt hum humiliated and she did not even know why. She fixed on him with her eyes. Jerry. She focused each word to steady her vocal cords. You have been gone an hour and a half for a smoke. You come back with no jacket, looking like something the cat dragged in. Excuse me, can I help you? She snapped at the eyes boring holes through her from behind the bar. Is there somewhere else you need to be? The bartender glanced quickly to Jerry. The three looked back and forth wordlessly for a long second. Jerry closed his eyes, sucked in one cheek and raised his eyebrows. This is my wife he said as he shook his head. 
the bartender turned on his heel and catapulted himself to the other end of the bar. Mora pushed through the pain in her throat. Now you're making no sense. She clenched her teeth and determined to remain in control. Now tell me where your goddamn jacket went or I'm going to scream. Jerry refused to look away from his shoes, an air bubble of breath out. Thank you. audience, a regular audience. Ah. Hi, I'm Gabby Ford. Um, primarily, I work with Italy Reads here, started by uh, Carlos Stews. And I will take advantage of being here to encourage you all at 10 o'clock to come on down and experience a lovely woman writer named Maura Buffini from Britain. And we are performing Love Play. It's saucy, uh, children are not uh, advised to come. It's, uh, it's um, uh, a 50 minute romp from Roman times today about sex and love with a little bit of music. It'll start at 10 o'clock and you'll be home in time to go to bed. <laughs> All right. Am I nervous? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. In Alemania. So have a drink or two. We encourage drinking before celebrating student talent. And um, come on down. Okay. This is a... I'm trying to edit what was once a dramatic monologue into a short story. And um, I'll share it with you right now. In 1983, New York City was post-Warhol, post-hippie, yippie, yuppie, punk, and AIDS. It was prior to politically correct. And therefore, the city had maintained a dinginess. During this X or me generation, artistic expression took to the streets. Guerrilla art exploded. You'd wake up one morning and a building would be wrapped in miles and miles of plastic or a tall fountain dressed overnight in an enormous condom. You'd turn a corner and be confronted with the realistically painted shadow of a man pointing a gun at you. Underground in the subways, the graffiti giant Keith Herring the prototype of today's Bans Bansky, was energetically drawing radioactive dogs, babies, and TV-headed men. In the Times Square station, for those of you who have not been, try to imagine a dimly lit underground urinal with hundreds of blue metal columns with signs front and back bearing the writings Times Square, abbreviated Times, SQ, period. That's full stop for the few Brits here. Uh, anyway, during this winter, someone took it upon him or herself to fill out in on those signs the identical additional letters of A-R-E and A-L-I-D, spelling out on every single one of those blue metal columns, times are squalid. Way past midnight, one night, I climbed down that dank hole in the ground, and just as I was descending to that putrid platform, I spotted my train, the number one, pulling out of the station. Having missed my train, I had 40 minutes to wait. Next stop, where to go? Move to where there's some, some light and wait. Move to the nearest needic stand, get a hot dog, Pile it high with sauerkraut, mustard, pickle relish, onions to work. You got time to kill and you will eat that dog in some time-killing way and find some time-killing thing to look at. But this night, 
is a special night. Because just as I'm paying for the Frankfurter, another number one pulls in. Way! The doors open, whoop, and they close. Leaving me alone in a subway car with three broken lights, graffiti on the wall, and two very strange men. Stranger number one, fast asleep, is dressed in a polyester leisure suit. His matching vest, ruffled shirt, and flared bell bottoms were fluorescent yellow orange. And there was something out of kilt about this flaming dude, and though I knew I shouldn't, I couldn't help myself. I stare and I stare until I spot it. A matching bottle of fluorescent yellow orange beer placed smack in the center of his scrotum. Stranger number two, hello. Even though it was February, he was dressed for a nice summer stroll. He wore plaid Bermuda shorts, a spaghetti strap t-shirt, and as a gesture to the winter's wind, donned a puffy woolen cap. He also had an umbrella without any cloth, with which he used in his mind's eye to drive the subway. Some stuff. Three, two, one, Times Square doors are closing. 50th Street coming and going. Ooh, 59th Street next. One, two, three doors opening. Columbus Circle. I can talk to her now. I can talk to her now. I can talk to her now. Ding dong. Ooh, little lady. You real lucky I stopped the car for you now, you know? Mmm, real lucky. You real lucky I stopped the car for you. Mm hmm. Because just him and me. He don't count. He's asleep. Yes, sir. It's just you and me, and we are traveling the city alone. The two words, thank you, gave me time to gather my wits. Three, two, one, doors closing, 60th Street, Lincoln City, long gone, 70th Street, 79th Street, ding dong. I can talk to her now, I can talk to her now, I can talk to her now. Oh, little lady, dang, you got some big muscular legs. Yes, sir, we bump. Ooh, they are some big calf muscles. Now. How did a pretty little lady like you get them honey Schwarzenegger legs? Something I read, something someone said, something suggested to me that when confronted with true madness, a sure way to survive it would be to mirror the madness. Yeah, you bet. I got muscles in my legs. I got muscles in my arms. I got muscles all over, in fact, and I bet. You're try probably wondering what kind of girl has these kind of muscles. The kind of girl who has just come from karate class. Whee! Three, two, one, doors closing. So we're getting faster and faster. 86 long gone, 96 coming into groove. And so 103, one, one, two, three, doors open. Ding dong. I can talk to her now. I can talk to her now. I can talk to her now. <sighs> little lady, now what you got there in your hand? What you holding that little pretty little hand there? I got myself a hot dog here. I was hungry after my black belt karate class. <laughs> Looks like that yogi got some mm, yummy sauerkraut. <sighs> oh, pickles, onions, mm, 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 mustard. Yeah. It's good, all right? Mm -hmm. Mustard is good and nutritious, and I need all the calcium and protein I can get after kicking the crap out of my students, of my advanced black belt, deadly street fight karate class. Chill out. Real man, chill out. Doors closing, 110th, 116th, depends on which way you exit. Either way, Columbus University moving, grooving into 125. Take that job, man, alive. 125th Street, Harlem. And what you gonna do with that little hot dog lady? You gonna eat that whole 
the thing by your lonesome? In Harlem, I divvied up the dog and made sure to offer him the bigger half. Whoop. Unfortunately, um, any un wait, sorry about this. Unfortunately, fear had blocked off my throat. So any attempt to mirror copy, sorry, his eating skills was thwarted by a sauerkraut and pickle relish explosion from my nose onto my clothes. The only thing that stood between me and my traveling companion was a Nedix paper napkin. I tore the napkin in half and gave it to him. And he watched me as I wiped up my hot dog splatter. And I realized something had changed. He was now marrying me. The driver eyed me head to toe. Satisfied I had nothing more to offer, he turned back to his driving. 137, 145, 157, 168. 168th Street, George Washington Bridge, George Washington, Washington Bridge. My stop, my stop at last, before he could turn around, I am out the door waving goodbye. In my hasty exit, I bumped into a Bronxward bound New Yorker who steps far aside to let me pass. And before going onto the subway, he looks at me as if I'm the crazy one. <laughs> that night, while walking home, I decided that I would go to live in Europe. <laughs> It was rather a hard act to follow, isn't it? Um, all right, so uh, my name is Connor Dean. Um, I write as Connor Fitzgerald. And um, I chose this here, uh, um, The Fatal Touch is the name of the novel, because it's essentially set here, in these, this area here. In fact, the character whose diary I'm about to read from lived in that house there, the one that the, the, the two-tone one with orange and gray. In real life, his name was um, Hebern, whom perhaps Bill might remember, who was a forger. <laughs> yes. And um, I thought I'd disguise this character. This character dies in the first scene, and this is a diary. And this is the very last scene. These are last, these, this is the closing paragraph of the book. So the detective, essentially, is in, in bed with his, with his girlfriend. And he is reading from this diary written by this character who I thought I had loosely based on Eric Hebern. Now, obviously, I had, um, there's more of Eric in the character than I gave myself credit for because one day, um, a few months after the book had been published, a, uh, an Englishman appeared at my front door and asked me all about Eric Hebern, how I knew him how well we got on together and so on. I never used the name Eric Hebern in this. I gave him another name. I also gave him the dignity of being Irish as opposed to English. <laughs> uh, but yet he was recognizable enough. The reason I gave him um, an Irish character, I mean, the reason I made him Irish was because, now this is an Irish obsession, or it's an obsession among some of us Irish, is that we speak the wrong language. We speak English. And um, this, is a, this is a common trope in Irish writing that the language we're writing in is not the right language. Now, if you write a detective series in Rome, which is what I've done, you have the same problem. The detective is speaking Italian. And so what I tried to do was write almost as if it were in translation, as if it had been written originally in Italian and then translated back into English. A sort of hands-off approach to it. But, maybe for relaxation, I made him Irish and I gave him a diary so that I could write a little bit more in my own voice. And that's what these final paragraphs are about. So, that's the scene. 
there, uh, Alec is the name of the detective. He's in bed with uh, Katerina, his girlfriend, and he's reading from the diary. And this is the closing scene. So the eye in this is the dead guy, basically. Oh, by the way, he was found dead uh, on Vicolo del Moro, near the, uh, the corner bookshop. Um, foul play was suspected, but uh, they weren't sure. He was also a good drinker. After London, I went back to Ireland for a few months, but it did not work out. There was nobody there for me, and all I did was spend the little I had saved drinking pints of plain in Sinnott's pub. It was one golden afternoon there, when I was on my fourth pint, that I conceived of the idea of walking away from it all, literally walking away. No one believes me when I tell them I walked to Paris and then Rome, but with the help of one ferry boat, that is just what I did. The walking started in Normandy, but the beginning of my journey was a freezing cold morning of drizzle as I left Kalini Hill Station for Bray to catch the mid-morning train down to Rosslare in County Wexford, where that evening I boarded the ferry that would bring me to Cherbourg. It was June, but the Atlantic was still in a swollen and wintry mood and rolled me back and forth across the lounge bench inside where I tried to sleep without success and doused me in icy spray when I went up onto the deck to vomit. We docked in Cherbourg at lunchtime, and having completely emptied my stomach of all contents during the night, I was ravenous. Every time I go to France now, I search for a croissant as buttery, savoury, and perfect as the one I had that morning in a bar in Cherbourg. I had to mime my wishes and point to what I wanted to eat, like a well-trained monkey. And I was aware of the seamen smelling of diesel oil and surrounded in black tobacco smoke, laughing at my expense. But hunger swept away all embarrassment. It also swept away four days of the allowance I had given myself. For it was not until my third day in France that I realized how much they had overcharged me. I had traveler's checks in British pounds and some francs. The traveler's checks were a parting gift from my stepfather the night before I left. He pulled them out of his jacket pocket with a jocular expression on his face, as if someone had put them there unbeknownst to him, and he was just discovering them, like a kindly uncle might discover candies or thruppany bits in his pocket. Ho, 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 what have we here? My inheritance, you bastard. It was enough to live on for one frugal month. To be fair to my mother and stepfather, they were probably expecting me back soon, but I never saw either of them again. My stepfather died suddenly of heart failure a few weeks before I reached Rome. My mother had sent a telegram followed by several letters to a post restant address at the main post office in Piazza San Silvestro. But I arrived several weeks later and did not bother checking for letters until several weeks after that. By the time I had read through the letters, my stepfather was dead almost two months and my mother was so hurt she had decided not to speak to me again. Nor did she, though I do not think she ever intended permanent silence. But eight months later, when I finally had an address of my own in Rome and wrote to the post office asking them to divert the mail to it, I received a letter from a lawyer telling me that she too was dead of a stroke. The funeral was over. He assured me it had been a dignified affair and he had looked after the financial costs and would forward the remaining inheritance, which he did. The last trace of him was his signature on a check for a scandalously modest amount that arrived just in time for my first Italian Christmas. But that morning Cherbourg, with the sea wind stabbing my ears and the strap of my army surplus backpack already rubbing my shoulders raw, I set off on the first stage of what was to become a six month, 2000 mile meandering walk. It is hard to say now why I decided to walk Part of the idea was to arrive in Rome, the inevitable destination in 1969 for an aspiring painter who preferred the classical style with a certain sophistication of manner. I thought I would learn French by walking through France and I was not entirely mistaken, though I learned far less than I had hoped. I had read Baudelaire, Rimbaud and Leonard Cohen. I wore my hair long and heeded the spiritual advice of psychedelic rock stars. And I wanted to take a long, slow walk away from Monica, Ireland, and my old self. 
I had a small tent. The tent had a small hole. It did not rain that night, but the wind whistled. I started walking in the wrong direction on a minor road that skirted the coast. I set up my tent in a ploughed field near a place near, named Koskville. All the villages there were named Somethingville. I slept between the ridges of two furrows and woke up half dead from cold, damp and lumbago and raging with thirst. I'd filled a water bottle in the toilets at the Cherbourg docks and I thought it would have done me. I found a farmhouse, or better, as I drew near a farmhouse, I was chased, caught, crowded and cowed by a pack of dogs. I think I was crying when the fire farmer finally came out to shoot me dead with a very military looking rifle. He looked at me, paying particular attention to my hair, then deciding that I was obviously some sort of bewildered half woman and posed no threat, sent me into his wife. Oh, oh, I kept saying, as in the French for water. <laughs> it's written here. Um, all right. The farmer and his wife thought this was very funny, but they gave me water and milk and rolled up a buckwheat pancakes and pointed me in the direction of San Lo, which they seemed to imagine was my ultimate destination for who could go farther than that. Or maybe that's what they thought I meant with my pathetic cries of oh, oh. But night fell before I'd even reached Carenton and I turned left by mistake and started heading back towards the sea. I had to pitch my leaky tent in another field and lie there listening to the sea turning in its sleep, the slap and drag of rocks on the beach nearby, trying to imagine what warmth and Italy would be like. The rain came in slantways and in the morning, the frost was so sharp and hard, I thought it would pierce my boots. It may have been the hunger, the cold, or just the age I was, but that morning in which I could have died from exposure, I felt brighter, more alive, and bristling with hope than I ever have since. I turned my back on the Atlantic and finally started walking inland toward my future in Paris, Provence, Florence, and finally Rome with its ochre architecture, crumbling decay, and endless days of heat and sun. All this beautiful life lay before me. Katerina slept, her breathing regular, her mouth open in a tiny O. He closed the book. Okay, hello, I'm uh, Andrea Di Robinant. I, uh, 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 oh, it's nice and warm. The, yeah, because I was getting kind of chill. Uh, but so I'll be brief. I, I know some of you are getting cold, but uh, what do I do? I, I, I teach what Elizabeth teaches. Uh, with, what, with travel writing, creative nonfiction, uh, and what? Etc. Right, etc. Um, and uh, the, and I write nonfiction. And uh, this is a, a very short excerpt from a, a book that will be published um, by Knopf in, uh, on June fifth this year. So this is the first uh, public reading I'm doing of this book. Um, it uh, takes place. It starts out in 1948. It's uh, Hemingway comes to Europe. He is um, he's, uh, struggling. He's, uh, he's just about 50 years old. Uh, his marriage is not really going anywhere, his fourth marriage. He hasn't written a novel in 10 years. Um, the critics consider him uh, 
an author of the past. Um, they're more interested in the novelists that are coming out of World War II and writing big books, bestsellers. Um, so uh, he's not he's not feeling too good, and so this they decide uh, uh, his wife and and Hemingway decide that instead of going out west as they usually do in September, they're going to go to Europe and they're going to go to France and uh, tour Provence and uh, drive north to Paris where they had fallen in love and stay at the Ritz and maybe get things going again, the juices flowing, as it were. Um, and um, uh, actually, things don't turn out that way in the sense that they never get to France. Uh, instead, they come to Italy uh, because the, the ship on which they're traveling has um, uh, the rudder breaks, and so they can't land in the, the they they can't dock in the small harbor at Cannes. So they have to come to Genoa, and the, the sh it's a very impressive the ship because th he has decided to come over to Europe with his royal blue uh, Buick tied up like a mermaid at, on the foredeck of the ship. So it's a very dramatic arrival in Genoa. And uh, as some of you know, uh, Hemingway had spent time in Italy as a young man. He had been wounded in Fossalta di Piave, uh, nearly died uh, when he was 18 years old, very young. Uh, he spent a lot of time in Milan uh, convalescing. And then uh, he was uh, back in Italy many times when he was a a young writer and a journalist living in Paris. He came to Genoa, among other places, and uh, with and was spent time with Ezra Pound. And uh, anyway, so Italy had been a familiar terrain for him, but he had not been back for many, many years because he was persona non grata during the fascist regime. So he hadn't been. Uh, back to Italy in uh, at least, uh, well, uh, over 20 years, right? So, so it was a, a surprise arrival. Nobody was expecting him in Italy. He lands, and the moment he lands, all these memories come back to him. And, uh, uh, and the, the, Mary Welch, his wife, realizes that, uh, you know, they're not going to go to to France. They're not going to go to Paris. He, he really gets involved with uh, uh, this Italian journey and reconnecting with, uh, uh, with the country. And they drive to, um, to the north, and they drive to Streza, and then they spend time at the lakes. Then they drive up to Cortina. They have a wonderful time in Cortina. They decide to rent a, a house, a chalet, in Cortina for the whole season. And then they uh, drive down to Venice, and they fall in love with Venice, and they stay there. And to make uh, a long story short, <laughs> they stay there for eight months on this first Italian journey. He will make others, but uh, they spend a long time. And this is where he starts writing again. Uh, and so this is the Hemingway settling in Venice. And I'm just going to take a sip of water. Okay, so Harry's bar was down just a couple of blocks from the Griti in the direction of St. Mark's Square. Hemingway quickly succumbed to the seductive charm of the place with its sleek 1930s design, cosmopolitan chatter, delicious seafood, well-trained bartenders. Giuseppe Cipriani, the ebullient owner, always greeted him with loud theatrics. After only a few days in town, Hemingway was already saying hello to half the people sitting at the low, comfortable tables. The crowd was eclectic and worldly, the perfect recruiting ground where he could pick new members for his growing Venetian entourage. He had two favorite drinking buddies, 
One was Princess Aspasia of Greece, a tall, formidable lady who lived on the island of Judeca and crossed the canal every day to take her meals at Harry's bar. As a young woman, Aspasia Manos, a commoner, had secretly married King Alexander I of Greece. Their union caused such a scandal they were forced to flee to Paris. They were allowed back to Greece only after agreeing she would never be queen. But within a year, a monkey they kept in the palace bit the king and he died of septicemia. Aspasia retired to Venice. She still had quite a royal aura about her and good stories to tell. The other regular companion at Harry's was Carlo di Robilant, actually my great uncle. His mother, Valentina, was the last of the Mocenigo, an old family that had given seven doges to the Venetian Republic. Carlo was an aviator, a seaplane pioneer, and had been called back to duty as a reserve officer in World War II. After the war, he'd struggled to hold on to a job and had fallen on hard times. He was a sweet man, tall and thin, with deep blue eyes and the remote gaze of the heavy drinker. His wife, Caroline, a North Carolinian with a wry sense of humor, quickly befriended Mary, and the four often dined together. The Hemingways were having such a jolly time in Venice that when the solicitous Alberto Mondadori, his Italian publisher, organized another shoot, this time at the house of Baroness Marga Marmaros Legard near Siena, the prospect of traveling down to Tuscany appealed very little to them. Mary conveniently developed a cold, which Hemingway used as an excuse to wire his belated apologies to the Baroness. I hope we have behaved correctly, he wrote to Alberto, fearing he might have made a faux pas. He insisted that Mary's illness was true and not diplomatique. Not to worry, he himself would handle the Baroness, Alberto told him, adding rather touchingly in his ungrammatical English that from the moment he'd met Hemingway, he'd always done his best to please him as I wish not to annoy you and to be a friend and not a businessman for you. Mary was actually fine and after resting one day she was up and about in time to welcome Fernanda Pivano and Ettore Sozzas who arrived in Venice for the weekend. The Hemingways liked to have them around. They are so loving and keen-witted and candid and interested in everything we say, Mary noted. As much as Hemingway enjoyed the company of his new Venetian friends, he was growing anxious about his work. Duck shooting parties, drunken evenings at Harry's with eccentric aristocrats, lunches and dinners and local osteria. It was all good fun, but it was getting in the way of his writing. Apart from letters and postcards, he had done no writing to speak of since leaving Cuba. He vented his frustration to Alberto Mondadori, telling him he'd rather write 100 words any time if good words, then shoot ducks. I have to work. People kill me. You never bore me, but many people have a corrosive effect on my boilers, and at this moment, I have to work badly. Hemingway's solution was to move to Torcello, the Byzantine island in the north part of the lagoon. Cipriani, the proprietor of Harry's Bar, owned a rustic country inn on the island with a restaurant downstairs and a few bedrooms upstairs. He invited the Hemingways for an outing on All Saints Day. They took a motorboat out, passing by Murano, the island of the glassblowers, and Burano with the colorful houses of fishermen. In Torcello, they had a pleasant lunch, looking out at the vineyards and the steeple of the old basilica. The place was enchanting, and the Hemingways decided to move there for the rest of the autumn, abandoning the Portofino idea. They returned to Venice that evening by Vaporetto, the public water bus, Quote, Papa singing to the gondoliers in the Venice canals. Two days later, having packed part of their belongings, they motored back to Torcello with the fog deepening and the night closing down and the gondola's slim black sickles curving suddenly out of the gray moving wall of mist. Mary thought it was all mysterious and wonderful. Torcello was a thriving island community on the far edge of the Byzantine Empire long before Venice and sprang to life. Indeed, its decline coincided with the rise of Venice. The old Basilica of Santa Maria Assunta with its splendid mosaics of the Last Judgment and the nearby church of Santa Fosca were the only vestiges of the island's glorious past. Now there were only about a dozen families on the island, 
living mostly off their vegetable gardens, orchards, vineyards, the fish and crabs they pulled out of the brackish canals, and the fowl they shot in the lagoon. The Hemingways settled into a spacious suite at the Locanda Cipriani with a small living room, a fireplace, and a bedroom with bone-clean scrubbed wooden floors and feather beds. They arranged their books on the bookshelves, moved their furniture around, and made themselves a little nest. Hemingway went straight to work on a piece he'd promised to Holiday Magazine on the fishing life in Cuba. In the afternoons, he went bird shooting or fishing with Emilio, the caretaker at the inn, or else he followed Don Francesco, the talkative priest, on his walks around the island, engaging him in rambling conversations about religion and death. Mary explored the basilica and the other sites on the island and visited the lace makers on neighboring Burano. Occasionally, she took the Vaporetto into town to get her hair and nails done, run a few errands, and have lunch at Harry's. During those first two blissful weeks on Torcello, she had plenty of time to be with her husband. They dined alone most evenings at the inn, at their table near the big fireplace. Hemingway entertained Mary with stories about growing up in Oak Park, which often turned into excuses to rant about his mother, that bitch who couldn't raise a family and made life hell for his father. He told her Indian stories and fishing stories from his youth up in Michigan. Mary was an attentive listener, recording in her diary everything he told her. Once Mary had done Torcello and the neighboring islands, there was not enough to keep her busy during the day. When Lucy Moorhead, an old friend from her war days in London, invited her down to Tuscany, where she now lived with her husband and their two children, Hemingway encouraged her to go. Mary was eager to visit that part of Italy, even if it meant leaving her husband behind. Early one morning in the middle of November, with Hemingway in his bathrobe waving from the porch, she took the Vaporetto into Venice, picked up the Buick at the garage, and drove south with Ricardo as chauffeur and meal companion, Ricardo being their chauffeur. In Torcello, Hemingway worked at his desk every morning, went shooting in the afternoon, and read past midnight every night. Although he complained that his shoulder was sore from those high, straight up and down shots, he liked to go out with Emilio every day. They'd bag an occasional snipe or two, but mostly they took aim at little birds of the lagoon, no bigger than sparrows, that flew over the vineyards, alighting here and there to pick at the grapes. The locals liked to shoot when the boat when the bird was posato, on the ground. Hemingway preferred to shoot when it was in flight, volando. I'm local champion at this and very highly regarded, he boasted to his wartime buddy, David Bruce. It is somewhere between a bumblebee shooting and bat shooting after it gets dark at the gun club and the pigeons have run out. Hemingway loved the rustic life on Torcello and the wide open views. Today is sharp, cold, and beautiful, the haze burning off the lagoon, he wrote to Mary one morning before getting started. He missed her now that she was on the road, but he was getting along fine and concentrating on his work for the first time in a long while. He soaked up the literary material that life offered him every day, sensing he could turn it into something good. He thought he might use it for a short story about duck shooting, something in the vein of Turgenev and do it better, of course. On a clear day from the top of the tower of the basilica and with the help of binoculars, Hemingway could see all the way to Fossalta, 15 miles to the northwest. Across the lagoon, the flat plain of the Veneto around the Piave was releasing old memories of the war that were now demanding his attention. And the past was being summoned by more than just the landscape. Fernanda Pivano, was in the process of writing an introduction to the new Italian translation of A Farewell to Arms. She wrote to Hemingway incessantly for details about his short time on the Italian front and about the explosion that had nearly killed him and how he had coped with the aftershocks. He was very patient and precise. I think the force of the explosion was very bad for my nerves and my head and they took a long time to get well, he explained. I know I couldn't sleep without the light on for a long time. In the silence of Torcello, Hemingway often lay awake at night, long after the fire had burned out. It was time to return to Fossalta. Thank you.
So, my name is Nefeli Misuraka. I've been asked many times, um, what's my nom de plume? And I've always answered, hello, my name is Nefeli. So I spent half of my life trying to explain that. So I usually tend to be known as just Nefeli. I teach a number of things here um, and in other universities. Let's say that in general, I think the best description is that I handle words. I have to do with words. Um, I would like to thank Carlos because he allowed me to be here and um, especially to be here as uh, the last person. I'm trying to turn this off because I always obey to my grandmother's rule, which is that at night houses and women are always most beautiful. So I'm very happy to be the last one to read <laughs> because darkness helps me. Um, also, I'm very grateful, I would like to say to Alison for trying to help me in translating um, my points, uh, which are freshly published in this, that I call an involuntary anthology. Uh, being Italian, perhaps the only Italian Italian here, um, you might imagine that my mother forced me to publish this. Um, so, <laughs> I've been writing poems all my life and I thought that was enough. I mean, writing, it's its own reward, but my mother said, no, you need to, you know, publish this. Um, so I published this and since then I found myself in the uncomfortable position of having to read it. Uh, Carlos was very nice and said, yeah, you know, we should, why don't you do it? Um, and. And so I will read only two of them. I tried very clumsily, and hence the thanks to Alison to <laughs> translate um, two of them. Um, I don't think I'm gonna read the translation after all, um, but I just want to say that um, these poems have been written with the general spirit of Mozart in mind. Therefore, they have a very tragic undertone um, and a very light-spirited, um, humorous, um, kind of comical at times, uh, uh, flair. So every time I sit down and I observe something that appears very tragic to me, what comes out is something very light-hearted, um, in form, not in, in structure, um, in, in content. And the opposite happens when I observe something very funny. So, um, also, I would like to thank all the people that read before me, um, except Gabby Ford, because I really would like to be able to read like her. <laughs> I feel terrible that I will never measure up. So, um, long story short, one of them was so unsuccessfully translated by me um, that I'm gonna read it in Italian. Uh, so, it's a very tragic kind of poem. It is about geishas, um, but it comes from a very funny story. Um, a poet friend of mine and myself sat down one day and just made a bet and we said, okay, can you put these words into a poem. And the words were very strange, like sufumigio. Uh, I don't know who of you are Italian, but it, it's a very old fashioned way to say aerosol kind of thing. Um, um, califugo, it's a corn plaster. Um, how would you put, I don't know, Epsom salts uh, and and things like that, um, supermarket, and cold cream. Um, so we had this kind of bet, which was a lot of fun. Um, eventually, he just said, no, I can't. And, and I ended up producing a poem that I think it's, it's kind of cute. It's nice. It's about geishas and how they handle all of these things. Aspirin, um, aerosol, um, Califugo, you know, corn plasters. But this one I will read in Italian, so forgive me, I 
I hope being, uh, I would like to also to thank Elizabeth because she was talking about fiction and nonfiction and the difference. Uh, basically, poetry is nonfiction, right? So, <laughs> right, I'm going to read this nonfiction uh, with the spirit of fiction. Um, Forti come alberi le gesce. Non c'è colpo di tosse dietro le labbra. Nascoste, se piegate, niente pazienza per le chimosi, il brufolo, i 40 gradi e passa. Dove vanno le gesce assalite da una malattia? Dove trovano il brodo? Dove tiene l'aspirina la geisha? Per il giorno del mal di testa, il suo fumigio, i sali per il mal di schiena, la pomata per le scottature, la geisha, li tiene in un cassetto segreto tra le foto, l'apparecchio per i denti e le bollette. Lontano dagli occhi, i segreti della geisha sono nel perossido, il califugo, nei buoni sconto del supermercato, che di giorno sfoglia serena, seduta, con la luce e la pomata sulla faccia, sorridendo un poco alle cose che ha perduto, là, con l'elastico intorno, alle poche carte che guarda, senza che le, parla, le parlino ormai di niente. Ok, e now the opposite. A very tragic story, me looking at my car, which was completely broken, I had to destroy it, have it euthanized, basically, and um, it came out a very funny poem, well, at least to me, so here it goes. And, and this was, a, I was able to translate it in, in English, I hope in a some, somewhat su successful way. My car does look like me, what with her antiquated bodywork and her fender bender dented round hips and her whimsical odometer beating to her own erratic uh, drum. My car smiles, carefree, upwards and downwards hills, white pupils in high gear on a breathless chase down barely visible roads, fearless when no one is around, ready to jump and take a bow at the shortest notice. My car remembers everything, asking nothing more than a few drops of fuel, a hint of burnt black motor oil and space, the white space, foreshadowing steep climbs, forgetful of the effort it takes climbing up and down. At the helm of a long line of cars piling up in the rear view mirror, because my car knows they will all disappear by the next merry meadow, where she will once again be free to roam and roll. My car surprises me, forever retracing Mozart's tunes, even while chased by an obtuse monster truck. Even when facing a cyclopic trailer blaring its one eye on the solitary road. Even while finding her balance on her two wheel suspension over a winter in a courageous, so bare, so white weather, a preparation for a summer never to come. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all uh, to the readers. And as you may have noticed at the back, we have a wonderful spread from Hummus Town, uh, the caterers. Please join us for some wine and some good Middle Eastern food. Thanks again. Thanks to everyone. Thank you.